Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I say that without irony, but I always feel when the introduction is as long as that, the audience sits there and they says, OK, so you can fly backwards through the air. Let's see it. Huh? So please forget all the introduction. I work at the Court of Justice. Um, and I begin with a very obvious statement. If you're in one international court, it's very normal that you look and see what another international court is doing. We learn from each other. Uh, Supreme courts and also in member states, the top court in a member state, will look across to see what their brethren in other high-ranking courts are doing. And they do that both in informal meetings, what in the lovely phrase in French is called the dialogue des juges, the dialogue between the judges. Uh, but you also do it in relation to writing the opinion in a particular case. And indeed, within the European Union, there's a kind of triangle that operates in relation to the protection of fundamental rights between the Court of Justice, where I serve, the Court in Strasbourg, the European Court of Human Rights, and the various Supreme Courts, Constitutional Courts in the individual member states. This is indeed what the conference last year was, was looking at. Uh, each can draw inspiration from the other. Uh, I have to say, also, each is a little bit careful because you don't like people to tell you that a different court gives better protection to fundamental rights than your court gives. So, actually, it's a very good way. This may not be what we think it's going to do, but in practice, this is the barrister speaking here, in practice, it has the consequence that the actual level of protection that is afforded to fundamental rights is, is enhanced, is improved. So this fact that we're all looking at each other and seeing what the other one is doing actually works to the benefit of the individual citizen. Now, I'm not going to do a rerun of last year's talk and discussion because I want today to look at something that's a, a little bit different uh, perhaps, in fact, that is unique in terms of judicial borrowing. And that is the relationship between the Court of Justice of the European <laughs> Union, the CJEU, to give it its full initials, and the court that decides for the EFTA countries, the EFTA court. I say it's perhaps unique because... There is something conceptually that really is unique about the relationship between the CJEU and the EFTA court. In many respects, we are interpreting exactly the same material. And this is unusual. I mean, the Strasbourg court is interpreting the ECHR. We are looking at our charter in the context of EU law. All right, the charter borrows from the European Convention of Human Rights but we're not doing exactly the same material. In contrast to that, as between ourselves and the EFTA court, we really are looking at the same material. We will be looking at the wording of the same directive or the same regulation or the same concept of free movement of goods. Yet we're looking at the same stuff. And important point here to stress, which court's going to get there first? There is no golden rule. It is chance. The case may end up first before the Strasbourg court because that's the way it happens. Or it may be that we go first because we get a reference from a national court that asks a particular question. So chance is what will dictate that. Now, what about borrowing from each other? Well... I mean, you can say, on the one hand, of course you borrow, right? I mean, there are vast swathes of EU technical regulations that apply within the European economic area as well as within the territory of the EU as such. Because that's the whole point, that we have a single economic space in which the same rules apply. So, you know, if you've got technical rules and you have a court looking at the meaning of those technical rules, there is a very good argument for saying, well, if you are the second court that looks at the problem, you should just piggyback on the reasoning of the first court. You should look at what they said and say, oh, you know, thank heavens they did all that work first. We'll just say the same thing. 
On the other hand, it has to be said that the court in which I serve, the CJEU, uh, is in some senses a slightly jealous court. You know, we rule on the meaning of EU law, and nobody else tells us what EU law means. Huh? We are the court that lays down literally the law, the meaning of the law, for EU law. And uh, we saw this a little, perhaps, in opinion 2 of 13 on EU accession to the ECHR. And there were people who criticized that opinion uh, because they said, well, you know, the court is being really rather jealous of its prerogatives. And it's saying, you know, we you can't do this because we are the people, we have these rulings that we have and they're important and we go first. So, you know, given that on the one hand it would be good to borrow and on the other hand, excuse me, we're the ones who say what EU law means, how does all this work? I mean, actually in practice, the answer seems to be that it works surprisingly well. Let's, let's begin with some general principles. How does the EEA, how do the EEA rules work? Well, they work, first of all, by saying that at the start of the story, at the date of entry into force of the EEA agreement, there is meant to be alignment with the case law of the court up to that point, with what is called, in the jargon, the acquis communautaire. Article 6 of the EEA agreement indeed states, and I quote, without prejudice to future developments of case law, the provisions of this agreement, insofar as they are identical in substance to the corresponding rules of the EEC Treaty and the ECSC Treaty, and to acts adopted in application of those two treaties, shall, in their implementation and application, be interpreted in conformity with the relevant rulings of the CJU given prior to the date of signature of this agreement. So there's a lock in terms of all the case law up to the point when the EEA agreement was signed, that case law is binding and is meant to dictate the interpretation of the provisions of the agreement. There is then an arrangement for alignment with the ongoing developments in the case law, what has been called the homogeneity goal. Note the word goal there, it's the objective. So, recital 15 of the preamble to the EA agreement tells us, I quote, whereas in full deference to the independence of the courts, the objective of the contracting parties is to arrive at and maintain a uniform interpretation and application of this agreement and those provisions of EU legislation which are substantially reproduced in this agreement, and so on and so on, uh, it's to arrive at an equal treatment of individuals and economic operators as regards the four freedoms and the conditions of competition. So the goal is four freedoms and conditions of competition, equal treatment, therefore parallel hom homogeneous application of the rules. And that is duly reflected in Article 3, Parrot 2 of something which is known as by its, its nickname as the uh, SCA, which is in fact the uh, agreement that deals with the surveillance authority and the jurisdiction of the, of the court. Uh, that article, Article 3.2, says, in the interpretation and application of the EEA agreement and this agreement, the SCA agreement, the EFTA surveillance authority and the EFTA court and here are the words that are important, shall pay due account to the principles laid down by the relevant rulings of the Court of Justice of the European Union, given after the date of signature of the EA agreement, and which can turn the interpretation of, and then it goes on, terms, provisions, the rules of the EC Treaty and the ECSC Treaty, insofar as they are identical in substance, to the provisions in the EEA side. Horribly long, complicated article. What matters there? Pay due account to. Not the same as these rules bind you, these decisions bind you, but pay due account to. And 
it refers to the rules insofar as they are identical in substance. So those are the key, key elements, pay to your account, rules that are identical in substance. Okay, homogeneity. Yes, well, homogeneity. Substantive homogeneity, what I've just been setting out. Um, there is also, for those who like to try to categorize this, they, they do identify two other types of homogeneity. Uh, an effects rated related homogeneity, what is called in French an obligation de résultat. What that means, in fact, is that the F to court in relation to implemented EEA rules has recognized full state liability and direct effect and primacy and the principle of loyal interpretation. The big difference, however, being those rules have to be implemented. There isn't direct effect from the terms in the agreement itself. And then, just to complete the position, there is also something that goes by the nickname of procedural homogeneity. Are the procedures, in fact, the same? Well, they're, they're not exactly the same, they're similar, but in some little respects, they're not 100% identical. What is recognized as a court or tribunal under the EFTA rules is not exactly the same as what is recognized under the ECJ rules. Now, both courts are, therefore, they're applying similar principles, teleology, consistent interpretation, but they're doing so in slightly different universes because the universe of the EEA is not the same as the universe of the EEC, now the EU treaties. The most obvious example would be that the reference procedure under the EU regime, so the procedure under Article 267 TFEU, is a mandatory procedure at a certain point, and the rulings that are obtained there under from the Court of Justice are binding. If you're a national court and you make a reference and we give you an answer, that answer is binding. Parallel procedure under Article 34 SCA, that procedure is more discretionary and the rulings that the EFTA court gives are advisory. They're not binding. The integration, the level of integration, is less far-reaching under the EEA agreement than it is under the EU treaties. But having said all of that, we are talking about a single space. So the aim is homogeneity plus reciprocity. That comes through very clearly, for example, in case E1213, EFTA surveillance authority against Iceland. And as the EFTA court put it in case E1014, Enes de Vici, the EEA agreement has linked the markets of the EEA EFTA states to the single market of the European Union. If that's what's happened, you have to have rulings that also match. So, let's have some examples from the, if I can call it this, the CJEU end of the telescope, from us looking at them. Now, it seems to me the first, and in a sense, the most important point to make is that not only is our case law being cited before the EFTA court, you'd expect that because they're meant to either be bound by it or take due account of it, but EFTA court judgments are being cited before the CJEU and the General Court. They are being cited by lots and lots of different players in the story. They are, for example, being cited by, the, by a referring court. If I, uh, if I look at case uh, C371 of 12, Petillo, the judgment in that, this is a case about compulsory insurance against civil liability in respect of motor vehicles. The judgment records at paragraph 19 of the judgment, quotes, referring inter alia to the judgment of the EFTA court in case E807, Celina Nungen, against the Norwegian state, the Tribunale di Tivoli expresses its doubts regarding the compatibility with the first, second and third directives and the directive 2009 
of national legislation which does the following thing. So here is the national court relying on a ruling that's been made by the EFTA court as buttressing its doubts about whether what the Italian rules are doing is in fact compatible with a proper reading of the directive and on that basis it makes the reference. So national court citing. The parties, the parties cite. For example, the Commission cites. Uh, example of that would be uh, case C4102, Commission against the Netherlands, where the Commission is pointing out, uh, as rightly pointed out by the Commission, even after the national authorities have authorised the marketing of a foodstuff fortified with a given nutrient, they remain free to refuse a subsequent application for marketing authorization on the basis of the situation brought about by the first authorization. All very, very technical, right? What's the basis for the Commission's submission? The basis is case E300, EFTA Surveillance Authority against Norway, and the court is endorsing it, as rightly pointed out by the Commission. Yes, the EFTA court got that right. That is a correct interpretation of our rules. Uh, you can also find a disappointed party in an appeal saying, wait a minute, the general court disregarded the advisory opinion of the EFTA court and we got stuffed. Uh, that would be the argument that was made uh, in the PPG case by PPG. Uh, so this is uh, case C36805P. PPG Group against Commission and Council, and at point 41 of that judgment, the court records that PPG didn't uh, provide a sufficient statement of reasons, and it thus disregarded the advisory opinion of the EFTA court in case E601, Seba Specialty Chemicals, Water Treatment and others against Norway. You'll be sad to hear that the court felt that although the Court of First Instance didn't go into all the details of the arguments put forward, it had done enough to satisfy the requirement to state reasons, so that argument failed. But the argument failed not because the EFTA court decision was irrelevant, but because the court on the appeal found that the general court had given sufficient reasons. And of course, advocates general spend a lot of time drawing EFTA court decisions to the attention of the Court of Justice. My very nice colleague in Chambers, Peter Yertler, who's your second speaker, I think, rather than second or third, um, did a search for me when I was trying to prepare this talk. He found 68 cases in which the Advocate General's opinion discussed EFTA court rulings. Four of them are mine. And the F, and you know, we do that. The General Court, ex Court of First Instance, also draws heavily on EFTA court case law. Exactly the same research found 28 citations going back to 1997. Initially, the influence may have been a hidden influence because the court doesn't always say everything about what's going into its thinking. Uh, I would regard as an example of that, I would regard the uh, reference procedure under Article 267, in its very first judgment, the EFTA court, in case E1 of 94, Restamark, said that a body is a court or tribunal entitled to make a preliminary reference, even if the procedure before that body is not an inter-parties procedure. Lo and behold, lo and behold, in 1997, the Court of Justice followed that, in case C5496, Dorsch Consult, and it did so even though the Advocate General, Advocate General Tesaro, had recommended going the other way. So I think there's probably some cross fertilization there. There are plenty of examples now of the court being a little less coy, if I can call it that, actually expressly recognizing the influence of the EFTA court. So expressly echoing and citing, uh, you would find an example in case C52204, Commission against Belgium, citing case E103, uh, EFTA Surveillance Authority against Iceland, 
Both the Court of Justice and the EFTA Court have recognised the need to ensure that the rules of the EEA agreement, which are identical in substance to those of the treaty, are interpreted uniformly. So express recognition of that obligation, citing EFTA Court case law. And there are examples, technical examples, I probably better compress this so that I don't run over time, but there are lots of technical examples of cases where the Court of Justice has duly arrived at exactly the same conclusion as the EFTA Court did before it. Uh, for example, for example, case C37515 BAWAG, which is about payment services in the internal market and the obligation to provide information on paper or on another durable medium. Here, the information was transmitted by means of the electronic mailbox of an online banking website and we have the court in paragraph 43 quoting the Advocate General's opinion and quoting what was held in essence by the EFTA court in its judgment in Inconsult Anstalt uh, in case E409. It must be held that certain websites have to be classified as durable mediums within the meaning of Article 4, Power 25, Definitions of Directive 2007-64. Does it really matter whether a particular type of website is a durable medium? You can call it either way, but the point is, if you're going to run a single economic space, it really matters that the definition by the EFTA court and the definition by the Court of Justice should be the same definition. Same statement can be made in relation to the compulsory insurance against civil liability in respect to the use of motor vehicles. Uh, case on that, case C27712, Drodstops. A case about TV without frontiers, clearly another very much, as the title of the case says, very much a case which is about going across frontiers. That's joint cases C3495, 3595 and 3695, De Augustini and TV Shop. And that absolutely quotes decision, uh, decision in joint cases E894 and E994 in the EFTA court. Very clear cross fertilization It's not just the chambers of five. It is that sacred space. It is the grand chamber. The Grand Chamber has also expressly followed EFTA authority. It did so in case C45204, Fijium Finance, where it quotes and endorses the judgment of the EFTA court in case E100, State Management Debt Agency against Eastlands Banki FBA. What about the court deciding otherwise and why? Well, I'm really sorry to disappoint you. I think somebody, I think somebody needs to write a PhD thesis because this is a big, it's a really interesting question, but it would also be a difficult, big research job because what you'd need to try to do would be to identify what had exactly what had been put before the court in all the written material and then see if the EFTA material had been put there, and then see if in substance what the court had done was, in fact, something which ran clean against the EFTA court. I suspect you don't find things that run clean against so much as things where there are nuances. And we find, uh, we find a, little, a little hint, perhaps a tantalising hint of that, in, for example, the opinion of Advocate General Vahl, in case C20616, Marco Con Tronchetti, Provera and others, where he's looking at the meaning of the, uh, this is company law, and protection of the interests of minority shareholders in relation to takeover bids, and what the words clearly determined mean. And he says, at point 51 of his opinion, now, as for the specific meaning of the terms clearly determined, 
both sides in the main action rely on the judgment in Periscopus. However, that judgment, that was an EFTA judgment, that judgment doesn't settle the present matter. And he tries to explain why the circumstances are different, first of all. Then he says the Italian rules at issue here are not as laconic as the Norwegian rules were in that case. And finally, that judgment doesn't bind this court. So, I mean, there's enough material there that if you decide not to follow the EFTA court, you have perfectly reasonable grounds for doing so. There are illustrations from the EFTA end of the telescope, mainly, of course, the EFTA court follows very loyally. But there are places where it doesn't, but it has good reason not to. The, the really classic example of that would be the, uh, what's, what's usually known as the Kellogg's case. Uh, that's case E300 ESA against Norway. We had a situation there where, uh, in Norway, the sale of Kellogg's cornflakes, fortified with certain vitamins and with iron, was banned. And the Norwegian government's argument was, look, uh, there's no nutritional need to have these fortified cornflakes because in Norway, in Norway, every school child up to the age of 15 is given a piece of goat cheese, fortified with iron, every morning. And as a consequence, Norwegians have enough iron for the rest of their lives. There is no need to feed them fortified cornflakes. And so the Norwegian government invoked a nutritional need argument for blocking free movement of goods, and it was relying on a very old Court of Justice precedent, a precedent from 1983, namely case C17482, Sandoz. The EFTA court didn't accept that nutritional need argument. It held that Norway was in violation of the EEA rules on free movement of goods. A year later, we have commission against Denmark in the Court of Justice in case C19201. And the facts are similar to Kellogg's. And the commission comes along and says, look, you know, after court judgment, it's an element in the development of the law. Sandoz was 20 years ago. Since then, methods I used to determine health risks have undergone changes. There's risk analysis. You know, come on court, change your mind, change the case law, follow the after court. The Advocate General was not really sure that that was a very good idea. Uh, and the AG recommended following Sandoz. That was A.G. Misha, very reliable A.G. The ECJ did not follow him. The court departed from the Advocate General, followed the EFTA court, and indeed the EFTA court judgment is mentioned, I think, six times in the judgment of the Court of Justice. The other example would be the moment where you have, uh, where you, first of all, I suppose I should say, if you have relevant Strasbourg case law, the EFTA court looks directly to Strasbourg. It doesn't look to Strasbourg via Luxembourg, right? It just looks directly at the Strasbourg case law. And perhaps one could cite case E1510, the Post and Norka case, uh, as being an, an example of that happening. Uh, and if you go to the writings of the former president of the EFTA court, uh, Karl Baldenbacher, uh, you find him giving examples of what he calls creative homogeneity, meaning we see a way of moving this forward, so, so we, should, we should actually do that. My conclusion. I haven't tried to give you any kind of a comprehensive review. I've tried to offer you some illustrations, and you know, yes, the remits are different, so obviously it's open to the two courts to do slightly different things. It seems to me what is striking is how careful both courts normally are to reach the same conclusion. It's striking, but it's not actually surprising, because given that we're trying to get a uniform interpretation of economic law for the whole European economic area, if they didn't do that, it would be all too easy, if you had divergent jurisprudence, to have 
conditions in which there was a real economic incentive to distort trade flows. I will certainly, as an AG, if I find an F to case in point, I will always study it carefully and I will always draw it to the court's attention. It is always useful to see what other good judicial minds have made of a particular problem. And I'll, I'll give you two very, very recent examples where my work, my current work, has required me to take account of EFTA case law. I've just, first example would be that I've just finished preparing the draft of an opinion in case C298-18 Grafen Polar. The main court of justice authority that I was looking at in that was a case called Likenna, case C17299. That case cited the EFTA court case, in which, by the way, I'd represented the UK before the EFTA court, a case called Eidesund and Stavanger, case E2 of 95. And it was the EFTA court that established the entirely correct proposition that the fact that a transaction is covered by the public procurement directives doesn't of itself rule out the application of a different directive, namely a directive protecting workers in the effect of a transfer of undertakings. It was the EFTA court that made that ruling, which then is echoed in Likena before the court goes on in Likena to reach some other conclusions that I didn't want to follow. We'll see. Uh, so that's one example, and indeed what I'm doing right now is a case looking at whether a judge, uh, it, where a judge who is qualified for the office of judge is appointed by a procedure that is flawed, then what should happen? And that involves my looking at Strasbourg Authority, a case against Iceland decided earlier this year, which cites a case in the General Court of FV, but also an EFTA court case, case E2116. And now we are looking at it again against the background of the Strasbourg case, citing the General Court and the EFTA case. You know, if that's not cross fertilization between courts, I really don't know what is. But the point I'm trying to leave you with is that looking at EFTA court authority in my court is not just a potential abstract additional tool, it's a normal part of daily work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Charlton. Uh, will there be any questions? No? Any questions to Uh, yes, I have one question. Um, I, uh, I found there is one uh, academic paper on the internet about this is like uh, like independent research about ECJ. Uh, it's called this title. It, it this research is in English. It's uh, on the internet. The, the title is approximately. Uh, judges or hostages, this title has uh, the words uh, mm -hmm. judges or hostages. It's, it's uh, like writing about uh, some internal uh, limits or difficulties uh, like uh, in, in the structure of this ECJ. And, uh, but uh, because, I'm, because I'm, I never worked at this organization, uh, my question is: Do you uh, have you read such kind of uh, paper, uh, academic uh, paper? I think it's uh, on the internet. It's made by Americans. As mm -hmm. I, if I'm not, if I'm right, have you read it? Is this? Uh, can you maybe comment? Is this uh, like uh, true uh, or uh, like worth to read? Okay. And are there any many, many maybe any more such independent uh, descriptions of this? Uh, of the work of ECJ. Right. First, first of all, I haven't read the paper. I'd be delighted if you were to give me the references to it. Right. Please Second, please. no, no we, but I'm, I'm spend most of my time writing opinions. Um, for, you know, I don't have perhaps as much freedom to do research as I would like to have, speaking as a Cambridge academic. But I will see if at some stage I can find it on the basis of, of judges as hostages. Judges or hostages. Uh, okay. Title, title. okay, I'll go, you know, I, at, 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 at some, some stage, if I'm not writing an opinion, I'll go and look for it. 
My uh, first question about it would be whether the people who were writing it had actually spent time at the court and talked to judges or whether they were looking at it in an abstract way from the outside or quite what was the basis for the analysis, right? Because I, you know, I, I, a paper I haven't read, I have no idea what the basis of it was. Uh, it may be that it was a very solid piece of, uh, of research. It may be that it was a piece of research which was based on theory but didn't, was not complemented by uh, an empirical part talking to people who were working at the court. I have no idea. The idea of a judge as a hostage is a rather curious one since uh, as far as I'm aware I'm very independent. I think most of the people who read my opinions would think that I was independent. Uh, I think that if you take the word hostage and distort it a little, judges are hostages in the sense that judges decide cases. They don't operate uh, in sort of free-fall academic mode. A judge has a job. The job is to decide a case. The case sets the parameters for the analysis. If the case raises points A, B, and C, but not points X, Y, and Z, the court is not going to talk about points X, Y, and Z, except touching them in passing if they form an essential part of the background to deciding points A, B, and C. And this is also what is wrong with the argument that unfortunately you hear rather often in my member state of origin that the Court of Justice had a, has a federalist agenda which it's pushing. Either I'm very unobservant, I've been at the court now since 2006, right? either I'm very unobservant or alternatively the court doesn't have such an agenda. My impression of the court is we're a very busy court with a very heavy workload. And when we treat a case, we give the case the amount of treatment that it needs in order to dispose of it efficiently and we hope correctly and then move on to the next case. So we are hostages, right, of the fact that we're judges in a busy court. But I don't think we're hostages in any other respect, no. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, Kari Ginter from Tartu University. Very good presentation. I've, I've always struggled with this dilemma myself about the EFTA court and the ECJ and the mutual respect that keeps this alive because as soon as you start ignoring each other, this is a huge danger. Mm. And currently, um, uh, I, I just returned from Nottingham from this uh, public procurement conference and now the public procurement lawyers are actually in this situation with the first Alinean case, I think about damages in procurement law. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware of this or no, but it's a... I, I think I'm going to say yeah. if it's public procurement, I'm going to say I think you should probably direct that question to Peter Yertler, I think who's one of whose very, uh, very detailed areas of knowledge this is. Fortunately, this is not the procurement-specific question. Okay. But uh, what the EFTA court said in that case is that for procurement cases, when you have a damage claim, then a simple breach is enough and you don't need the... It doesn't need to be great, 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 great manifest the, or... The, uh, fra the uh, fact to tame brasserie du pêcheur. Right, exactly. And, uh, and I'm wondering if you would predict that the ECJ or CGEU will follow it easily, because uh, I understand it's a quite source of intrigue in Norway, and uh, it's, uh, I, they I are expecting it another decision from EFTA overturning yeah. it, or maybe not, and so on. It's like, well, thank you for flagging it up, and I'll, wat I'll, I'll watch that with interest. I mean, of course, the case law in the, in the uh, ECJ is not quite as simple as to say, oh, it has to be a gra gra gravely a manifest. Yes, you've got Brasserie du Pecheur and Factor Tame. You've also got, B you've got uh, British Telecoms, where uh, because the interpretation that was being followed was one that previously the, co the commission thought was correct, only it turned out not to be correct, that wasn't grave and manifest. You have Dylan Coffer, where you fa fail, there is total failure to implement a directive on time. Obviously, that triggers it, and so on. So, you know, I, I think perhaps my starting point would be to say that actually the case law of the CJU or ECJ, whichever set of initials we prefer, uh, is, is actually more nuanced than just to say, we always say that the breach has to be absolutely, you know, 
dramatic before there's a right to damages. We've been having a rather interesting time recently, for example, with the cases involving undue delay in the general court. Yes, the Gastein and all of those. And looking at uh, how those claims, I mean, you know, clearly there comes a moment when a delay is really just absolutely inexcusable and inordinate. But where's the point when you get to that, you know? Where, where do you move across from ordinary case handling, perhaps slightly slow case handling because there's a lot of work? Where do you cross the, th the threshold, the frontier? From that, it was a bit slow, perhaps that's regrettable, but it's not a damages claim, to the moment, no, 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 this is absolutely ridiculous, this is inordinate delay, it's a damages claim. So to the extent that our existing damages case law, if you take it more broadly, is actually a more nuanced creation than just fact attainment, brasserie de pêcheur. You know, I, I'm tempted to use a very British quotation, keep calm and carry on, you know. We'll, we'll see what happens here. I'm, I'm sure there will come a moment when we do have to look at that. Uh, I don't know whether I will be lucky enough to be the AG looking at it, but uh, when we have to look at it, I'm sure that we will take some deep breaths and then look at it. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Uh, maybe I can ask a question from uh, maybe other perspective, constitutional law perspective. Uh, uh, Ms. Charlton, you also wrote uh, Advocate General's opinion in San Wittgenstein uh, case. Yes. And my question is, uh, how do you think in which cases the rule, uh, rule having a constitutional status uh, could be capable of justifying restrictions on freedom of movement rights in the EU? Should they be absolute rights or uh, pr uh, uh, principle of proportionality is a core? Do you think in which cases it would be I, possible? I just don't think we approach it like that. Uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, I understand, of course, why you're asking the question, because it would be very nice if one could impose a, a sort of clear intellectual framework the rule has to fit in the following category of norm, and if so, it will trade off in the following way. But if you take a different example and you take the Maloney case, right? If you take uh, that example, Maloney is a case about a trial that happens in absentia and there's a European arrest warrant issued. And essentially, I, I didn't revise this uh, for my viva today, okay? So I'm going to try and get it right. But essentially, your problem was that in Spanish constitutional law, uh, if the person was surrendered to an arrest warrant after a trial in absentia, uh, that should, the surrender would be subject to the condition that there should be a retrial at which he was present. And in the original version of the European arrest warrant framework, decision, uh, there wasn't a specific arrangement about trials and absentia. But then the framework decision was amended. And the amendment, which I think was a new article 4A or something like that, the amendment specifically dealt with trials in absentia and said, if there was a trial in absentia, but the following guarantees were respected, then you should surrender the person to the European arrest warrant and no, you couldn't impose conditions on that, such as a retrial. So at one level, it looks as though you've got a head-on conflict between the EU law rule and the Spanish constitutional rule, except that Spain had actually agreed to the amendment to the European arrest warrant. And seen from, seen from the perspective of the ECJ, at that moment, the, if you like, the big constitutional issue, I mean, of course we saw it was there, but actually the answer could only be one way because the member states together had actually agreed to make that change. They had agreed what, condi what conditions, what guarantees should be in place in order to protect fundamental rights. And they had agreed, and we agreed also, we looked at it against the background of the ECHR, that the, the fundamental rights protection that is required was there. And against that background, no, you couldn't then have the individual constitutional rule coming in and overturning what had been agreed at EU level. 
Uh, I'm going to do a little aside here. If there was a problem under Spanish constitutional law, actually the moment to raise that problem and to think about it was while the amendment was being put through to the European Arrest Warrant Framework decision. Because you, you, I think you have to keep in mind that all of this is an interactive process, interactive between the, there's no such abstract thing as the EU legislator. The EU legislator is the member states there together and the European Parliament. It, it's not, I, it, in the jargon in the UK, it's often said, you know, Brussels has decided that, and that is bullshit. Brussels hasn't decided that. The member states together acting with the European Parliament, have decided X. And there is the space there to raise the problems. And if there is a constitutional problem, then you have to work out how you're going to go about it. Are you going to make the necessary nuance within your constitutional law? Are you going to gather allies on the European scene so that you don't have that particular requirement in EU law? You know, if you don't sort it out there, then sooner or later, all you need is a bright lawyer with a client and a case, you know. You will get the case coming to the Court of Justice on a reference, and yes, it will go straight to the Grand Chamber. There's a flashing light over the top and a siren going off. Look out, I'm very dangerous. But, you know, jesting apart, there is the, there is the space within the system to sort that out. And I come back to the fact that the court deals with individual cases. We don't approach this on the basis of a formal structure that these particular norms classified in this particular way then meet these norms classified in this way. Of course we have rules as to hierarchies of norms, yes. Of course we have basic principles like supremacy and direct effect and we have the fundamental principles of EU law and we have the overarching principles in the Charter protecting fundamental rights. I mean, you know, I can, I can draw you the schema of the framework within which we're deciding. But within that framework, we decide individual cases. We don't put a stone in place for the future great development of EU law. We look at the individual case. We try to decide it in a way which is A, just, B, in accordance with the law. Those two should go together after all, yeah? and that makes sense in terms of the overall shape of EU law, where it's coming from and where it's going to. But that doesn't mean that we have a clear picture, here is where it's going to, and I will take the existing case and you know, somehow turn it inside out if necessary in order to get it to fit into that picture.